Thank you for that. Uh, excited today to, uh, to continue in and finalize our series that we've been into, and I'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, like Steve mentioned in his prayer, I'm sure it's been on uh, most of your hearts and minds, as it has my heart and mind, about the events that are taking place in, in the Ukraine and in Russia. And uh, many of you have been praying for uh, one of our members, uh, Yvonne and Randy Albaugh's son-in-law, Mark Posey. I uh, actually had a class with uh, Mark over at Lipscomb years ago. Mark is the uh, minister up at the Winfield Church of Christ, but he was doing mission work in the Ukraine. And just this weekend, uh, he had, he's made his way to Poland. Uh, so we praise God for his continued protection over Mark, but we pray more, more importantly for everything that's going on uh, just in our world. And so I want to continue to ask us uh, to be in prayer about that. Uh, we've uh, been in a series called Grow, but I want to tell you, about a series coming up next week. Uh, we are going to be launching into a series, walking through the letter to the Hebrews uh, in the New Testament. And so I want to encourage you to be preparing for that. And uh, in order to help you to prepare for that, we have journals, Hebrews journals that are out in the foyer. And those are $5 a piece. Uh, so I would encourage you to grab one. They also come with a Homewood Church of Christ coffee mug. All right. So you can have your coffee mug and your journal and you can walk through this study with us. And of course you have to have a coffee mug because we're walking through the book of Hebrews. All right. Some of y'all will get that in the parking lot and you'll think, man, that was, that was a good one, preacher. That was a good one. Um, but we want you to, to participate in this study, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week. And so I'd encourage you, and it doesn't have to be one of those journals, and hey, and if, if you don't have the $5, just pick one up anyway, that, that'll, be, that'll be fine, no worries there. Uh, but we want to help equip you to walk alongside us in this study. Uh, today we wrap up our series in the uh, topic of grow, as we've explored uh, what it means to, to make and grow followers of Jesus. So this past fa fall, we unpacked our Vision 2030. And you'll see five banners out in the foyer that, that help highlight those pillars of our Vision 2030. And in the past several weeks, since the turn of the new year, we've been looking at our mission to make and grow followers of Jesus. And we've been exploring the next steps of what a growing follower looks like. And we've gotten each of these next steps, not because we think these sound good or not because, hey, these are, are churchy good things to do. But we've gotten these next steps by trying to follow Jesus. What did he do? What was he about? How did he walk? How did he talk? How did he interact with other people? And so we want to follow in his footsteps. And we believe that these are seven of the characteristics, things that, that Jesus taught us and exemplified in his own life. Uh, and I'm excited this weekend that we're launching uh, two new pages on our website at homewoodchurch.org uh, about our mission and our vision to, to help explain our DNA a little bit better. And I would encourage you to go and swim around our website a little bit this week, particularly on these two pages. Uh, you might not be able to see uh, everything on the screen, but if you'll scroll through those slides, uh, you'll see some of the, the new pages that we have. And this is just a great way for, for you as maybe a, a new member, maybe as a guest, uh, but also those who have been here for a while and just are, are curious about, hey, you know, I missed a few of the sermons or I missed a few of the, the, the things that we talked about. Uh, and this just gives you an opportunity to go back, have some resources, have some things that you can uh, better get a picture of our mission and our vision. And so I'd encourage you to send these links to people, uh, send them uh, to, to family members uh, so that you can become more familiar with our mission and our vision. And one of the greatest acts of love that you can show toward a friend is to help that friend know Jesus. So the best way to do that is to share Jesus' story. I love that song we just sang, tell me the story of Jesus. What does it look like to tell your one? Uh, you'll see that this is the seventh and, and final step in our series today. So if you have your Bibles, uh, please be turning to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, we're going to camp out there for a few minutes this morning. And if I were to ask you to draw a picture or to draw a portrait of God, if I were to hand you a piece of paper this morning or you take a piece of paper out of your, your, your purse or, or just have something to write on or draw on, what would, what would you draw? I mean, how would, you, how would you draw that portrait? What would that look like? Uh, if you've known my family very long, you know that every Halloween we uh, take the liberty to dress up as something together as a family. Uh, so we've been the Incredibles. Uh, we've done uh, the Toy Story thing. We've done the Little Mermaid thing. 
We've done the Doc McStuffins thing. Uh, we've, we've done all these things. And one, one time we were talking about and brainstorming about what we were going to be as a family, what we were going to dress up as and, and participate maybe in Trunk or Treat or Fall Festival here. And, and so the idea came up, well, why don't we dress up as the characters of the Inside Out movie? Uh, and you'll see those characters on the screen. And without missing a beat, uh, my, my kids just automatically said, yeah, and dad can be anger. I was like, the little red guy on the far right. And I had, to, I had to stop and just think for a moment, like, is that really how they see me? Like, I mean, I know, I mean, I'm, I got to lay down the law every now and then, but is that, is that how they see me? You know, as, as this angry guy in a little tie, that's why I don't wear ties, because that guy wears a tie. Um, but the question remains, you know, how do, we, how do we see God? How do we see our Father in heaven? How would be his name? And so, as a father, I had to ask myself, uh, is there some truth to that? Do we place our human experience onto our heavenly Father? What's your portrait of God the Father? The way that we portray our faith in God reflects the portrait that we have of God. The signals that we give off to people about our faith is a reflection of who we believe God is. And so in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells these three parables because Jesus made a habit of having parties with the wrong people. This was kind of what Jesus did. And they ask, why does Jesus party with the wrong people? In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Is it possible that they are just being consistent with their portrait of God? Because they, the way they understood God, the invitation list to the party was a very, very short list. But Jesus paints this different portrait. So the first story that Chapman read just a moment ago to us, this first parable in Luke 15, Jesus tells about this lost sheep. And in those days, you didn't keep sheep in order to, to have them for their meat. You kept sheep to have them for their, their wool. And so you kept them in this common village flock for years. And what do we see in this parable? The, the reckless love of the shepherd that we just sang about leaves the 99 to go find the one. Then calls the neighbors to rejoice and to party when that one is found. Second story is about this lost coin. And so this wasn't like just a quarter that fell out of this lady's purse. Some scholars believe that in that time, in that context, that many married women had a necklace of 10 coins. And that is what they wore to signify that they were married. So instead of us thinking about just, oh, a quarter fell out of her, you know, in between our couch cushions, you know, like how it happens from time to time. What if this was more like a wedding ring that was being lost? And can you imagine, ladies, if you've ever lost, lost your wedding ring, uh, can you imagine just the panic that kind of sets in on where, where did I put it, where I'm trying to retrace my steps, where did it go? Inevitably, every time I preach on something, not every time, but a lot of times when I preach on something, God will, <laughs> he will teach me something about that the, the week before. And I thought I got through the, I thought I got through the whole week without having to, to learn this lesson. And then this morning I lost my wallet. And there's a certain time that I got to, you know, I try to get out and try to get here a couple of hours early and all that kind of stuff. And I'm trying to, trying to find my wallet, you know, and I, ha I get in the car. I don't, I, I don't have it in my pocket. So I go back in the house. I'm tra tramping through the house trying to find it, you know, and, and I, I hit my head on the, on the car door as I'm getting out. Um, you know, unfortunately, I'm here. I, mean, I could have knocked myself out. Nobody would have known. I'd still be laying in my driveway this morning. But I found... I come back to my, my car and I, I sit down in the driver's seat and there's my wallet sitting right there on the console after I'd spent 15 minutes just plowing through the house trying to find it. I was like, okay, okay, God, I, I understand. 
Just a little, little pre-sermon lesson uh, for, for me this morning. Tom Wright says this, that in the stories of the, the sheep and the coin, the punchline in each case depends on the belief that the two halves of God's creation, heaven and earth, were meant to fit together and be in harmony with each other. If you discover what's going on in heaven, you'll discover how things were meant to be on earth. That after all is the point of praying that God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. What is Jesus saying? He's saying to the religious folks, because of the picture that you have of God, you look at these people and you think that they're filthy and dirty and they just need to be thrown out. But God says they have incredible value and someone needs to go find them. In the last story that he told as the, the final kind of startling brushstroke to this portrait that Jesus is painting of his father. Because in the last story, it's arguably the greatest story ever told. There was a man who had two boys. And in that culture, there was nothing that was more important than land. We, some, we, we kind of get it in 2022 because we know how scarce, you know, finding land and the market and all that stuff can be right now. But in this day and age, it was, land was, was everything. And everyone knows that when the dad dies, the boys are going to inherit and manage the land. But the youngest boy comes up to his dad and he says something that absolutely stunned Jesus' crowd. He comes up to his dad and to this day, if, if, if a child would do this, and, and particularly in this kind of culture, that, that child will more than likely be kicked out of the house, never to come back again. But he, he comes up to his dad and says, hey dad, you ain't dead quick enough. I want your inheritance now. And the only thing more stunning than this boy's request would be the father's response. That the father deeds him the land that was his. And it gets worse because you know what the boy does. He sells the land because you can't go and buy women and wine with land. You got to have money. So he takes the money and he goes to the border town. And everybody knows what happens when people go to the border town. Everybody knows what people do when they go to the border town. And this boy goes and he does it. People are hearing this story and saying that that's the most worthless son I've ever heard of. But the father that could not make that boy stay could not let that boy go. The father that could not make that boy stay could not let that boy go. So every night he sits on his porch. He looked down that road. And one night he sees him. We're going to let Jesus finish the story in Luke 14. Luke 15, verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Here's what I want us to catch, church. Nobody, nobody had ever painted a picture of God like this. Now, we, we read this a couple thousand years removed. And it doesn't always have the same impact. But if you, were to put your, if you were to hear this afresh, if you were to put yourself in the context, if you were to put yourself in the, in the day and age of the people in Jesus' day, when you would be hearing this, nobody had painted a portrait of God like that. And I would contend that even though many of us have heard this story all of our life, most of us don't have a portrait of God like that. 
Can you see God at a party? I mean, my guess is you can see God in a courtroom with his judge clothes on. My guess is that you can see God in a boardroom running the universe. You might even be able to, to see God as anger on inside out. This, these are portraits that we have of God. But can you see God at a party? Can you picture God wearing one of Richard Magnani's Hawaiian shirts and how Craig's flip-flops? Can you see God at a, at a party? Jesus saying, if you can't see God right, you'll never see people right. And Jesus said that the old man ran. And back then, older men wore robes. And you can't run in a robe. So men over 30 years old never showed their legs in public. And now at age 41, looking at my own legs, it's probably good for us to reinstate this, this law. <laughs> so he had, to, he had to be undignified in order to run to him. He had to pull up his robe, reveal his legs, and run to his son. He was literally taking the shame of that boy on himself. And I would suggest in that run, you see another story. You see the sprint from heaven to the cross. You see this story is ultimately Jesus's story. No Pharisee ever saw God like that. Because if they did, they would have joined the party. Did you notice out of all three of those parables, how do they all end? They all end in celebration. They all end with a party. Everybody rejoices. Everybody is partying. Of course, except for the, the fatted calf who was killed. He was probably not celebrating. And the older brother. The older brother doesn't rejoice. The older brother doesn't celebrate. Scripture says that the older brother becomes angry refuses to go in. So as most good parents do, the father goes out to plead with them. If your child runs to their room, closes the door, eventually you're going to go back up. Hey, come back. Come back to the family. T tell me, tell me what, what happened. Verse 31, my son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything that I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And then we're, we're left with this cliffhanger because Jesus doesn't tell us if the older brother comes in or not. Jesus doesn't let us know. He doesn't tell us how this story ends. But in the genius of Jesus, I believe that he is calling us to put ourselves in that story and say, the decision's yours. What are you going to do? The dad said that we had to celebrate. The choice is yours. But this is not just a story about the prodigal son. What we see is that this is also a story about the prodigal father. Because that word prodigal means spending money or resources freely and recklessly. Do we believe in the reckless love of God? Do we believe what we sang a few moments ago? Do we believe that we have a prodigal father? Jesus implies that for the father, the party is non-negotiable when that which was lost is found. Is it possible that our churches aren't full enough of younger brothers and they're way too full of older brothers? Some of you have had bad experiences with older brothers in the church. 
I just want you to listen to me right now. That older brother religion and following Jesus are not the same thing. And I say that because there's been times in my life where I've been the older brother. Jesus came to find the lost and to invite them to the party, not so that they could remain lost, but so they could be found in him. Two sons, the rebellious son and the religious son. Rebellion is unrighteous. I'm my own person. I express myself. I don't play by the rules and I, I do what I feel and I'm true to myself and it's unrighteous. Religion comes along and says, I'm better than those people. I'm smarter than those people. I'm harder working and more compliant and I make better contribution to society. They ruin everything and I'm the one holding it together. They're self-righteous. The unrighteous and the self-righteous. And the question becomes, where do we find ourselves? And the only way that we come to resolution in this story is that we're reminded that there's a third son. It's actually the son who tells the story. He's the key to the whole story. He's not the rebellious son. He's not the religious son. He's the son of God. His name is Jesus. And our next step is to maybe tell somebody about him. In his book, Speaking of Jesus, Carl Medeiros says to relax, enjoy your friends, enjoy their company, along with the company of Jesus, point him out freely without fear or intimidation. You're not responsible to sell him to them. You're simply saying what you've seen. You're not the judge, you're the witness. So a couple takeaways for us this morning. I encourage you to got these down, talk about these in your connect groups, how that we can practically apply the things that Jesus is teaching today. And the first question that I would ask you is who's your one? Who's someone in your life that the Holy Spirit of God is putting on your heart right now? Just to tell about how Jesus has changed your life. Uh, for some, you have that person in mind, and I want to invite you to go to our online connection card and use that QR code on your phone and, and put, just put their name. You can do it anonymously, but just put their name. And I, I want you to do that because I want to, to pray for that person by name this week. And I'll commit to praying for every name that is submitted this week on our online connection card under the prayer request. For others, you may not have someone in mind. So my encouragement for you today is to, to pray for your one. We saying, lead me to some soul today. Did we mean that? Or do you think that that's just for ministry professionals? And I want to encourage you, church, you don't need all the answers. God doesn't need your ability. He's looking for availability. He's looking for surrender to say, here I am, Lord, use me. Step out of the boat and see what the Lord can do with a mustard seed of faith. And then lastly is, is our seventh and, and final step is it's not the end of our growth process. But it is one of the steps that we begin to take, and that is to tell your one. And I believe through the 50-50 challenge and other ways through daily interactions this week that you're going to have an opportunity uh, to be a witness for Jesus. That you're going to have an opportunity to be a witness for the one who eats with tax collectors and sinners. Because he is worthy of telling others about. Let's pray this morning. Father, we're thankful for some of the simple ways that Jesus taught. We're thankful that in, in your wisdom, you commissioned your son to, to tell stories. And that your word is not some IRS code. 
section 24, verse 3, that we have to dissect in, in such a way, but that much of your word is a narrative. And God, we're thankful for the meta narrative of you. And God, we, we pray that we'll be reminded that we're part of this, that story. So God, I pray that wherever we find ourselves, either as a rebellious child, as a, as a religious child, Father, I pray that wherever we find ourselves, that we will, we will look to the Son who, who brings life, the Son who brings freedom, that we'll be reminded of the God who goes after our hearts. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the way that it desires to, to be a blessing to this community. I pray that you will provide opportunities for us even this week uh, to just, just share some sense of goodness with the world that so desperately needs it. We thank you for Jesus. It's in him we pray. Amen. If you have a need this morning, a prayer request, or any way that one of our shepherds could minister to you, there'll be one down front. There'll be one down here in this, this room to my left. And if you want a more private setting, you're welcome to make your way back there. Today's the day that you want to be baptized into Christ and to start your journey with Christ. We'd love to celebrate that with you, and we will rejoice. Whatever you need, please come as we stand and sing.